everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Closers Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Marco Alvarado, and joining me, as always, is Quinn the Moondog Kalani. No howl today. No howl today because we have a third guest, or no, actually, a third host, I should say. She is uh, going to be acting as a host for this episode, very special episode on Nixium. It is the Queen of Chaz herself. Gabby, Gabby the Gator, LOL, Gabby the Gopher, LOL, Gabby the Goose is on the loose, LOL. How are you? <laughs> I hate this so much. <laughs> <laughs> you you gotta you gotta delete the jazz part. I'm sorry, but oh, that's, how you, you gotta that's take not even that out. That's not even bad. That's you not gotta even take bad. it out. That's it was a short. It was a short lived monarchy. That's not even bad. How is that bad? <laughs> gotta I, take. It's controversial. How is that controversial? It happened, and you're from Seattle. You live there, so I mean, <laughs> you live there, so you made it happen. So you're no, the queen. No, of it. no, no, no. That's not the insinuation. That's not what I'm like referring to. You just live cl- relatively close to it. It's a topical event. There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> hey, I was a supporter of it. Okay, so like, I don't, I don't think it's controversial. That's an honor, actually, um, to be deemed a. a queen like wow that's that's pretty cool i would nice think. safe wouldn't you like to be called a king quinn depends on what i'm the king of d the c, king of uh quinn. let me see you're in hawaii so like i don't know the king of the king of the university of hawaii that's an institution not there's, short-lived not as short-lived as chaz but it there's is ground there's there's grounds to validate that sure i'd take that yeah i don't see it as an as a big deal but um Anyways, Chaz, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have a really, 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 really interesting episode for you guys today. We are finally finishing our cult series. Uh, we started it with Jonestown a couple weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we extended it with Waco. And now we are finishing this series with a conversation on Nixium. Now, there's been a documentary series ensuing on HBO, right, Gabby? Have you have you been tuning into that? I have been. I'm kind of bummed that it's not like Netflix where they just put all of them out at once and yeah. you can just sit there and watch all of it. Um, but no, it has been an amazing documentary and it's actually been a lot of... I've resourced a lot of it, my information from that documentary, the couple episodes I have seen. Nice. And there's like three episodes out currently, right? Would you say? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, there's three. I've only seen two, but there it's so amazing how much footage they have and how encouraged videotaping and documenting everything was. Oh, really? So mm-hmm. is is Nixium still I know we'll, we'll probably get into this later, but like is it still running at the moment? Is it still an an entity? Or is uh, it, has it been disbanded from what you can see? Negative. We will chat about that towards the end because um, I have a whole timeline of the fall of Nixium Ooh. that we'll be able to get into. It's um, cool. Yeah. Well, Gabby, <laughs> without any further ado, welcome to the hosting life. Oh, <laughs> and uh, whenever you're ready, take it away. Let's let's go on this journey. Can I get some air horns? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Go, 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 go. (laughs) That's all I needed today. I can jump off now. Thank you for this opportunity. (laughs) Of course. You're very welcome. (laughs) No, actually, though, I just wanted to say thank you to Marco and Quinn for giving me this opportunity and working with you two. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Hopefully, if there's more information on Nixium, Jonestown, Waco, any fun things we find later on, we can do a second round of this. Oh, yeah. But there are more than three cults that have ever existed. There the are more than three. Um, so. Hopefully, it will slow down soon. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see. Time, we'll time see. will tell. Exactly. So did you two know about Nixium before we started this podcast? Um. Quinn, did you? Uh, I knew that the uh, old girl from Smallville was involved in it, but that was about it. Um, yeah, that's about me too. Like, I I remember seeing like a sixty minutes story on it, or or either sixty minutes or like twenty twenty or one of those shows. Yeah, uh, and um, 
and I was just like, well, that's weird. And then I just kept moving on with my life. Like, I was like four years ago, so, or two years ago. I two years ago, yeah, yeah. two years ago. So I just, I never really paid much attention to it until you brought it up. And I was like, what are these Roman numerals? So, <laughs> what's Navivum? Yeah, Roman what's nav- numerals? Navivium? Like, what? Yeah, it sounds like uh, the few people that I've also talked to about this as well is that they don't know what's going on, even though it's in the news. And um, I've definitely been following this story since 2018 after the podcast Uncover Escaping Nixium came out. Mm. So I highly recommend that podcast. Um, it goes into a lot more detail than what we can today. Um, and like we said, the HBO documentary too, those are great resources if you want to learn more. But before we go into nitty gritty, um, I do want to start off with just some words of compassion. Learning about these cults and cult leaders and any alternative lifestyles can be incredibly interesting, which is why you're probably listening today just to learn about something new, open your eyes to more of what's going on in the world around us. Yet, as we go through the rise and fall of Nixium, and we will probably joke around and emphasize certain parts of the story, we also have to keep in mind that people suffered. Similarly to Jonestown and Waco, people's lives have been taken up from under them, which unfortunately we see quite often. And I also have to say, I am absolutely no expert on any of this. (laughs) But you've been following it for a long time. You've been you've been a close surveyor of it I would <laughs> for a say. couple years now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the story of Nixium goes way beyond anything I can explain today. And even during research, I was having a hard time finding an aspect to dial in on because Nixium has so many moving parts. And this is just something to keep in mind while listening because we only have about an hour or so. While Nixium, while this doesn't compare to the 21 years of development that Nixium has gone through. So, with that cool. in mind, I will keep that in mind. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> Any Fine. more air horns? Boom, boom, boom. Go, 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 is that, is that his name? I don't know. Khalid. Khalid? Okay. There's a D in there. Khalid? Yeah, see, that's a dumb name anyways, so whatever. Is he, he involved in Nixium? He is not involved in Nixium. That we know of. That we know of, but but Nixium does have a ton of star power, which is why, um, Quinn, you mentioned you knew Allison Mack from Smallville, so she is another part of this. Um Yeah, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the intertwinings of Nixium go beyond the constraints we have here. This is an MLM turned self-help group turned sex cult, and it's full of star power, unfortunately some abuse, blackmail, and even consists of a branding ritual for women. And let's just go into, yeah, very sad. Um, but we'll go into some key players in the story that you'll probably hear their names repeat a few times. Okay. So we have our leader and or CEO, however you would like to view him, uh, Keith Ranieri. He is, as of today, he's 60. His birthday was a couple weeks ago. Oh, Boo. happy birthday, Keith. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. We hate your birthday. Boo. We hate your birth. He actually, um, Every year in Nixium, they had Keith. They had a week dedicated to his birthday, and it would just be a whole a week worth of events for his birthday, and everyone yeah. loved it. So it's just oh. a week of partying. Did they really love it, or were they like brainwashed into loving it? Based off of the interviews and stories, they actually really enjoyed it. Like it was a lot of fun for them. Wow. Well, okay. did everyone get a week long birthday, or just this guy? Just. Just Mr. Ranieri himself. Mm. So he's so he's the 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 ringleader in this entire. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. So he's the ringleader, and then we also have his business partner Nancy Salzman. She is more the brains and organizer behind a lot of this, while Keith is more the face and, I guess you can call him. He's the leader. He's I the see. leader, and then she's just more like organizer. So she's the Glenn Maxwell of this entire thing. I would say, right? Yes. 
<laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. Um, he's she was the helper to like Jeffrey Epstein. She was like the right uh, hand person who uh, helped him like plan everything and like set up uh, the unspeakable things that he was able to do. Yeah. Behind every man is an intelligent woman. Typically yeah. rolling her eyes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that's one that's one adjective I guess you could describe Ghislaine Maxwell. Sure, intelligent. I would go sure. with I would go with despicable, despicably intelligent. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, industrious, industrious. Yeah, that's another one, definitely. But anyways, Gabby, I'm sorry. Continue. Yeah, so we have Keith Raniere. We also have Nancy Salzman, and then we have Sarah Edmondson and Mark Vicentian. Vicentian. I don't think I'm pronouncing his last name right, but those two are the huge whistleblowers in the whole story. And Sarah Edmondson, she has been on countless interviews. She um, was one of the hosts of the Uncover Escaping Nixium podcast. I believe Ooh. she also wrote a book. And then Mark Vicentian, he is the producer and um of the vow, the HBO documentary. Oh. So they've been a huge part of exposing Nixium. And then we have our star power, which is Allison Mack from Smallville. She was so devoted to Keith Raniere. Star power. <laughs> no, I say that from like funding, but oh, from like a funding money. perspective. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So we have actress Allison Mack and uh -huh. then we also have the Seagram, the vodka Seagram heiresses, Sarah and Claire Bronfman. Bronfman. There's an F in there. Bronfman. 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 Okay. So <laughs> and what, then, did, what did they do? So it was mainly Claire. She had funded so much money into this organization. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. We'll get into that in a bit. Okay. Um, Sarah is not much of a face in this, but... Claire Bronfman. And then also, Nancy Salzman has a daughter, Lauren, who played another large role in this um, organization as well. And with that, we got all of our characters who are now all on trial. Um, but we'll get into that. <laughs> oh, man. So Nixium was founded in 1998 as a self-help group by Keith Raniere and Nancy Salzman in Albany, New York. So we got to talk about Albany here because for some reason, Albany is just home you know. to multi-level marketing companies. In yeah. 1964, the first multi-level marketing company was founded in Albany, New York, which was Holiday Magic. Do you guys know about Holiday Magic? No. They sold Sounds candles. Magical. It was not. <laughs> they sold candles but it was the very first one really uh, yeah Interesting. yeah what kind of candles scented ones sandalwood <laughs> sandalwood do they have sandalwood i hope so it would be holiday right that'd be slightly magical <laughs> that would be that would be i would i would agree with that it was is our bond established in albany new york because they're mlm too i believe that's a good question i don't know i would put my that. i would put my money on that i'm a betting man i'd bet on that Bet what are the that. Vegas odds? I need to know these odds. But yeah. Also, but, fun oh. fact, Mormonism was founded in Albany. That's when they very first started, right? In New York. What the heck's going on in Albany? I know. Upstate New York. What's what's in the water in Albany? Hmm. What's in the water? <laughs> Anyways, sorry. And so going back to Nixium, before Nixium was even developed, Ranieri created Consumer Byline, which in 1990 which is your very textbook pyramid scheme. Um, they had sold no product. Everything was based off of recruitment. And they were shut down in 1993. And so there was a little timeline, or there was a short time frame between Consumer Byline and Nixium. So I guess we can give Ranieri a pat on the back for that, for lifting up from his failures so Round quickly. of applause. Round of applause That's for it. him. He only gets That's like three claps. <laughs> Two. A triangle least. of applause. <laughs> Not even a whole round. So a little bit about Keith Raniere. We kind of talked about him earlier, but he is a self-proclaimed philosopher who also claimed he has the highest IQ in the world, which is very easily fact-checked and proven to be incorrect. He also made large claims like this, like being able to speak and write in full sentences as a very young age, as of like one or two. Mm. Those are a little bit harder to fact-check, 
but just based off what we know about him, we can assume they're not true. And he also claimed that he triple majored in college. So that is another one of those claims that has been easily fact-checked and easily been proven incorrect. But the members of Nixium, they were mesmerized by these facts about him or these lies about him, these claims. And I think this was part of the reason why a lot of people looked up to him. But after Consumer Byline, Ranieri created what we know today as Nixium in 1998, which started off as a self-help group. Him and Nancy Salzman created a hierarchy approach where students were able to become proctors and move their way up through different rankings. As a part of the hierarchy, students wore different colored sashes to represent their ranks within ESP. Are you laughing because I said stashes? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just Everyone like, oh, just gross everyone has a different it's like, but this is... This, you're selling me. This sounds like a pretty fun cult. <laughs> I get to grow a mustache? What? Yeah. Different if colors? You, if you can't grow one, you just like tape one on. They put the tape one on that's a different color. Just black construction paper? Yeah. <laughs> would, it, would different members have different style mustaches? So like the people with like the handlebars would be like big deals <laughs> or like the introduction the- level is just like a pencil like line mustache? The Is interns that... all have to have the Hitler stash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then like the big the big guy like would have like the the straight like Stalin just like caterpillar. Oh, I was thinking it would connect to the side. Oh, the mud. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. That, that this truly sense. is the darkest timeline. This is. <laughs> I agree. So they wore sashes, not stashes. <laughs> And like I mentioned, each color represented their ranks within ESP, which was their executive success program. So Ranieri's and Salzman's teachings taught what promised to be personal and professional development by eliminating emotional and psychological barriers. Nearly 16,000 people have taken these classes, and according to Forbes, each class was anywhere between $25,000 to $100,000. And this did not include the money that heiress Claire Bronfman was funding into Nixium. Wow. By 2017, she dumped nearly $150 million into the organization. Wow. Got to pay off those student loans. I know. Yeah. They're heiresses. They don't have student loans. Well, I was thinking for that triple major. <laughs> for the triple major. <laughs> I'll pay off his student loans. Yeah. And then so within Nixium, there's also the Executive Success Program, which is a 14-hour, 16-day intensive program, and each day costs $2,000. Every day? Every day. Wow. Yeah. This guy's just making money hand over fist. Yes. So I'm really concerned where this money actually went and why they needed so much money and how it was utilized. Hmm. So, but going back to ESP, ironically enough, the ethics behind the course was, I quote from Keith Ranieri, taking full responsibility for every aspect of life, never seeing yourself as a victim. During these programs, members were required to call Ranieri Vanguard and Salzman Prefect. ESP was incredibly demanding. Like I mentioned earlier, it was a 14 day, hour day, which Ranieri claimed to actualize human potential by teaching students there's no ultimate victims. Ranieri and Salzman's they tell these they tell this to their students a lot, especially when they come to them for hardships or any stressors, they ask them, so are you still a victim? Because if you're not a victim, you would not be having these issues. So this is kind of your first taste of manipulation okay. with them. And then on top of them being 14 hour days, students are just purely exhausted. Yeah which has been proven to be another aspect of cults and manipulation, just that mental and physical exhaustion. Yeah. And I do want to quote from a former member here. She said, they get you not to trust your own decision-making process. Said a former member, Sally Brink, who said she paid $145,000 to take Nixium classes over the years. They tell you that you need to make the decision that you need them to make a decision. You start to doubt everything. So, like I said, this is very manipulative. Yeah, you can see the start of the of where this is going. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. it's your first taste. Um, but all of these modules for this program were recorded, 
and we kind of talked about this earlier with the HBO documentary, is that there's so much footage of ESP and Nixium just in general, which I found to be fascinating because we, with Waco and Jonestown, there was also a lot of documentation, yet for Nixium, documenting was encouraged because Ranieri wanted to share his philosophy and show the world he was trying to do something Mm, good. Yeah. Which, ironically enough, backfired because (laughs) he obviously did not do anything good for this world. Uh, (laughs) So like I mentioned earlier, Nixium has a ton of moving parts, which included different groups within the program. So this is where DOS comes into play. And naturally, DOS has received the most attention in the media, and it's one of the largest parts of why Nixium fell and Ranieri was going to trial. What is DOS one more time? I'm sorry. Yes. So DOS is a subgroup of Nixium. Okay. And it was a it was meant to be a female empowerment group. And it actually from it's Latin for Lord over the obedient female companion. Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty uh that's a pretty long definition for for like such a like DOS. DOS. It, equ- it equals be like all this stuff. It's like wow, okay. DOS equals female slave. Mm. unfortunately yeah that's pretty rough yeah so women in nixium had to be recruited and went recruited into dos and when they were recruited they were required to give the recruiter or also their master collateral such as compromising photos and personal information which were later used as blackmail to force ranieri's demands on women which included sex so DOS, just to clarify, it was a master-slave hierarchy. So a master had to recruit a slave into the mm, subgroup. Okay. Yeah. And so slave or new recruits were required to be available at all hours during the day to complete tasks and requests from their masters. This meant that women had to respond to requests within a certain time frame, no matter what time of day it was. So in the podcast and also in the HBO documentary, Sarah Edmondson goes into this a lot because she had to be available 3 a.m., 4 a.m., any time frame to her master, which was actually Lauren Salzman, Nancy Salzman's daughter. And this is just kind of when Nick Sam all went to shit. So to continue. um, Yeah. (laughs) Masters also told slaves that being a part of DOS meant that they had to get a tattoo that resembled Nixium. That to, the tattoo was a way to show their devotion to the group. Yet little did the slaves know that this was actually a branding ritual. Early 2017, the branding began. New recruits were requested to go to a master's house in the middle of the night. Some claims were made that this was Alice and Mac's house. The women were told to strip down and lay on a massage table while other women held them down as Dr. Danielle Roberts used a cauterizing device to create a symbol on their lower hip. After 30 minutes of women having their flesh burned, the symbol actually represented Keith Ranieri and Allison Mack's initials. Wow. So I have a question. So Yes. So were the, like you said how DOS had like a master slave dynamic within that subgroup right Mm -hmm. so were the masters only women like was it women enslaving women or was it like men as the masters and women as the slaves no so that's was uh somewhat of the point of the whole group is that quote unquote it was a female empowerment group but um there i don't think any of this is empowerment obviously oh yeah of course so yeah it was only women and we aren't sure how much Keith Ranieri was actually involved in this group because mm-hmm. um, there were claims that he knew about the group, but then there's also claims that he didn't know anything about this group. So this is kind of where Allison Mack and Lauren Salzman comes to play because they were, based off of my research, they were kind of the middleman for Ranieri and this mm. group. Okay. So they were the ones that would use this collateral and force women onto Ranieri or first Ranieri onto women. Got you. Okay. And then because it's, because it's like women having to like bring into the group, their own slaves, there's already that, like, I guess for lack of a better term, like camaraderie with 
like the person that you're bringing in like they might be a friend right or like somebody that is really interested in the group so at that point it's easier to manipulate them because yeah they already they already you have a relationship established with them exactly right? okay. exactly so this is yeah i think you're spot on with that in that when people are they're already invested in nixion so what is one more investment to them yeah yeah. kind of it's crazy. That is um, crazy speaking of which still branding um dr roberts n- still has her medical license really today. yeah there's been a complaint to the new york health department and she saw as her license because it was not considered medical misconduct i know a couple of people that have gotten branded for shits and gigs but by a doctor <laughs> no no <laughs> i can't it's say it was a doctor de- definitely not a professional <laughs> was it for a cult i honestly couldn't tell you is it but is, it, it didn't look it didn't look good <laughs> is it are there doctors that spe- like that are like specifically for branding no like, i would imagine i would imagine it'd be like uh some sort of body modification artist like yeah uh, I don't know, like, you know, those people who get hooks in their back and they just got to mm. dangle. <laughs> what? This angel, right? Maybe. I don't Chris know who angel. that is. Oh, you don't know who Chris Angel is? No. The magician or the magician, the, the, the guy who had Mind Freak on like A&E back in the day. Yes, yes. He did that with the um, the rings on his yeah. back and he like hung over uh like a helicopter like they lifted him up with yeah it. Mm. yeah you I lost me in magic but i've definitely <laughs> seen people with meat hooks in their back dangle from rafters and stuff that sounds so terrifying i am i'm curious about those stories we're gonna have to talk about that at some point because just that image of just you looking up and seeing people hanging from the rafters from their back um mm. Pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting graphic. They're, right they're like plates of cheese and crackers being passed around. I know, you're just people like, oh. were, People were hanging down. It was like an exhibitionist sort of thing. Was it like Very Cirque du Soleil or some shit? Like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, if Hot Topic was running it. <laughs> Damn. Maybe Hot Topic from like 1996, sure. Hot Not Topic now. hasn't. Hot Topic hasn't gotten out of 1996. That's a lie. You haven't been in there. You were just in there the couple. I go to Hot ago. Topic all the time. <laughs> it's not the same. What? How can you say it's like 1996? They got the same lewd posters they've had for the last 25 years. I, th- I think you got to open your eyes, boy. When you go in there, like they don't, they don't have anything. Like they don't. Now have, I might like, be the, thinking like, of Spencer's. Yeah, I think of Spencer's. You're thinking of Spencer's. Same damn now, thing. Now, now, now they haven't changed since yeah. 1996. Anyway, hot topic. It's all just weeaboo shit in hot topic let's, now. Let's Anyways. get back to Nixium. Yeah. So branding, <laughs> branding, <laughs> and back to Nivivum. Nivivivum. On a sadder note. Oh. Um, wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah. So, side story. <laughs> Uh, we talked about Nancy Solzman and her daughter, Lauren. Mm-hmm. So Lauren was actually one of Keith Ranieri's girlfriends. And Ranieri believed that women could not have relationships with other men if they were in a relationship with him, except he was able to have sex and have relations with whomever he wanted. That's the common thread yes. between the three people we've kind of studied this entire time. They 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 want exclusivity from their Part partners. Time. Yeah, but, part-time monogamy. Exactly. They want right. they want their cake and to eat it too, or whatever the phrase goes. However, they want to eat their cake and have it too. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Yeah. So that was Keith, and Keith strung Lauren along for a really long time because she was so infatuated by him, and he kept promising her that he will one day have children with her, and that really that manipulation of children kept her along this whole time Mm. so there was a dos slave daniela flores (laughs) and she wanted to have a relationship with another man Uh yet ranieri saw this as an ethical breach so him and lauren actually kept flores confined in a bedroom for two years to heal her from one of nixium's sins which is excessive pride two naturally naturally sounds like purgatory (laughs) two years in a bedroom 
I yeah. have to say, every time you say Das, I just think it's like it's, we're just going into some German territory. <laughs> das, yeah, yeah. Das Slave sounds like a German EDM band or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, like, yeah, like they like a German EDM band from like 1986 that would have been in Hot Topic. I just, like, I just keep hearing like Flula Borg <laughs> every time. <laughs> Or like that one band that did, you know, the, the song Dota? Oh, yes, I do. It's like, I, I picture that. Das, das Slave. Yeah. Sandstorm by Darude. <laughs> can you, every time you say Das Slave, can you say, say it with a German accent, Gabby? I cannot. Oh, no. Dang. I oh, think that man. would be offensive. <laughs> offensive? <laughs> to Germans? They've only started every war ever. But, you know. <laughs> Hey, la, I, we don't, I, we don't, we don't, we don't want to offend the world's natural antagonists. Yeah, I've my my German friends who I went on exchange with, they were the most antagonistic towards German people that I've ever met. Like they they themselves are antagonistic towards themselves. They offend themselves all the time. The amount of Hitler jokes I I heard while I was in Europe, I thought it would be a lot less. I'll just Marco, say. please Nixium. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Sorry, let's pivot to another evil. I'm sorry. Yeah, so going back to Daniela Flores, this is and Lauren Salzman. So this is just another example of Ranieri and manipulating women into getting whatever he wanted. And I found that the branding was actually the height of Nixium. And this is when Sarah Edmondson blew the whistle on the cult. So by November of 2017, the FBI started investigating DOS. And around the same time, Keith fled to a villa. Y'all want to guess where the villa was? Mm. Is it in South America? Is it is it in Guyana? Good try, but no. Oh man, let me that, give it a shot. Let that'd me be give funny it if shot. it was in Jonestown. Like he just bought Jonestown say, and just went there. I'm gonna say it was Europe. These people seem seem like they have a bit more class to them. So I'm gonna say <laughs> Europe. Uh, I'm gonna go somewhere on the Mediterranean. I'm thinking, I'm thinking Portugal. Yeah, the use of the word villa. Yeah. Both are incorrect. Um, he, <laughs> he fled to a villa in Puerto Vallarta. Dang. Oh, shit. That's like Where's the that? intersection between like Guyana and Portugal is Puerto Vallarta. I think naturally people would think that. What are you Portu- talking what? about, Marco? What? Portugal is part of Europe. <laughs> no, I just I just mean cultural intersection. Oh, okay, like Puerto okay. Vallarta would be like maybe the cultural intersection. Because I thought maybe whatever. you were confused with the mythical land of Atlantis. No, <laughs> no, I, I definitely know my geography. I'm just talking culturally. <laughs> I should have specified. Anyways, Puerto Vallarta. Puerto Vallarta. The best Here port we... in all the world. So Keith fled there in shortly after the FBI started investigating DOS. He actually created a fake website with the same, with Greek letters to as a cover up for DOS. Mm. Fun fact. And then uh, March 28th of 2018, the Mexican feds broke into Ranieri's villa and arrested him on site. Now we're moving into 2019. Man, that's and so recent. Is, that's crazy. It's so recent. It's, it's wild. So as of 2019, this is when trials began. On April 2nd, Lauren Salzman pled guilty to one count of racketeering. April 9th, Allison Mack ple- also pled guilty to racketeering and racketeering a conspiracy theory. Nancy Salzman, Kathy Russell, who was Nixium's bookkeeper, and Claire Bronfman all pled guilty. Wow. I really want to talk to Kath- Kathy Russell. I want to know how where this money is going and how she wound up as a bookkeeper for a cult. That is a very interesting position to be in. I don't think... I, don't, I think that position is a very undervalued position within a cult. There's a lot of ins and outs. There's a lot of money going everywhere. That you bookies are always undervalued. Very undervalued. They're like the, they're like the, they're like the running backs of cults. They're like they're like the very undervalued position. You and we're like a tackle. Like, yeah, like a yeah. I would say a guard. Yeah. No, no, your accountant, your bookkeeper. That's an incredible position to be in because you are the one liable for everything i just think i mean in the terms of like from the outside like people always mm-hmm. look at like keith ranieri like mm-hmm. jim jones or yeah jim jones and like right uh, and, and they always look at that guy 
but they never think about the people behind the scenes that like prop yeah. that person up. So like the accountant having to deal with like the money coming in, especially from Nixium, the amount of money that they were receiving. That's Claire Bronfman's no one hundred and fifty million dollars. You're right. A cat, a bookies kind of like have all the power. Every yeah. Batman story ever, he always brings down the game by getting the bookie. It's true. And I Batman's mean, never wrong. Batman is never wrong. <laughs> It's true. Follow the money, guys. Follow the money. Follow the money. <laughs> so it, are they all in custody today, all these people? Yeah. So um, actually, so for Ranieri specifically, as of May 2019, he was 59 at the time and he faced a six-week trial. And as of June 19th, 2019, the jury found Keith guilty of all seven counts, including racketeering, sex trafficking, and conspiracy to commit forced labor. And then due to COVID-19, ironically enough, all of the sentences are unknown, but all accomplices face anywhere between two to 40 year sentences. Wow. <clears throat> so they're fucked. Yes. Wow. Well, good for them. They deserve to be. Not in a good way. So yeah, all of the accomplices face anywhere between two to 40 year sentences, which, and I believe that Keith, Keith is facing a lifelong sentence. Yeah, naturally, I would assume that 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 would be the the appropriate the, the terms at which his response. sentencing should be. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. that makes a lot of sense. I think. exactly. So with that, that is the rise and the fall of this MLM self help sex cult Nixium. Wow. So it really the the fall really began with DOS. Yeah. Yeah, there was just people that started to leave, started to get an uneasy. Mm. And Sarah Edmondson being someone who just did as many interviews as she could yeah. to exploit this organization. That is that is interesting that it's so recent. Like how and it's also under the guise of a business, you know, and MLM, mm -hmm. like there's those are everywhere now. So like I mean, with social media, it's like those are like a lot of the ads you see for, you know, businesses. A lot of them follow that MLM type of structure. Um, like I mentioned Arbonne earlier and stuff. So mm -hmm. to see that turn very sinister, more mm -hmm. sinister than Arbonne already, just annoying people with their ads everywhere, you know, flaunting their success in people's faces. That's already sinister enough. But to take it a step to brand people and to try to use women empowerment to like actually enslave women mm -hmm. that's that's just it's it's crazy to see but i'm glad that they're in justice like they're 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 brought to being brought to justice <laughs> there you go <laughs> injustice i don't know this whole story is wild and even though this was just a short overview summary of the whole thing there's mm -hmm. so much that goes in and out of this cult and there's just so many anecdotal stories that obviously we don't have time for it. And I think this is why I really liked that HBO documentary is because they do have the time and they do have the resources to go so much more in depth than we ever could. Right. So. Yeah, that makes sense. I have a question for you guys though. Yes. Seeing how we've kind of covered the spectrum of like government response to cults. Like we had, you know, in Jonestown, the government could have given couldn't have given less of a fuck about where those you know a thousand oh. people were going yeah and and in in uh, the, the case of Waco they they gave, they gave the too many fucks mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> in this situation it really seems that they are kind of nailing everything in terms of like sentencing and being able to keep these people alive uh, do you think Gabby that that response is because there's no like there is no like religious angle to the, to the to the cold. It's more of a business type of like self help mm -hmm. angle. It's a blue yeah, collar cold. Yeah, it's more of oh, it's, it's, white, it's color, a white, it's a white collar, collar cold. Whereas the other people we're seen as like like Jim Jones, he tackled or he he got people in by using the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and uh, you know inclusivity um, and tolerance you know, tolerance to try to get people into the cult. And then with, in terms of uh, the branch Davidians, they, um, divine yeah, divine purpose. purpose and the promise 
of revelation to get people in and to keep people in. And like, I'm just curious, like, do you think that because they're white collar, like this is a business centered thing and there's a lot of money involved. Is that why the government response maybe wasn't as harsh as in Waco? Like not nowhere close. Yeah. No one's coming in with like guns or. Yeah. They're not breaking the Geneva convention to stop this cult. Like, yeah. yeah, no, that's such an interesting take and observation on that, Marco, because I was thinking about that as well, because I think this is why the Bronfman sisters were, um, they weren't that, in, like, they're involved, obviously, financially, but in research, there's not a whole lot of statements about them, and there's not a whole lot of information about how they got into the cult or about them, so, and there's this quote from the dad Mm -hmm. their dad and it's like or I was reading a Forbes article and they talked about how somebody was talking to their dad and was like they're gonna run you dry Mm -hmm. figure this out get them out of this cult yeah and I think since there was a lot of finances involved but also as a self-help group it didn't seem malicious so there was no reason for the government to step in until this is when the branding started which is when it became malicious and when it i mean i'm sure it's this entire time it's been malicious Mm -hmm. but when somebody physically gets hurt yeah that is when the government the fbi started doing investigations so yeah, I think when you're you bring up a great point how it is a it's more of a white collar cult than a blue collar cult as yeah. in like Joe's town. Yeah. I have a question. Um do you guys subscribe to self help in general? Uh because I'll be honest, I think it feels like a crowd good I mean shit. what is self help? Just from like top helping to yourself? Yeah, of course I, I want to help myself. No, 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 no. Well it's 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 never self help because it's it's always someone else, someone else's input on how you could better yourself. So self-help itself, the term is a dichotomy. Well, it depends, I would say. Because um, even self-help books, well, it's not self-help. You're reading someone else's um, ideology to better I yourself. I think that there's, there's different types of people where those things are positive for them and they're positive influences. And then there's other types, you know, there's certain people who look for something to just latch on to. Like, in every cult that we've studied during this series, like, the people that are being preyed upon are people that are hurting, people that are, you know, wanting to better yes. themselves. They want to feel like a part of something. Um whether that you know they're missing something they're missing in their something lives. so in it, the 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 cult is the solution even though they don't think that they're in a cult but it that cult that group is the solution to that like void they probably feel you know a lot of people in ex cults have come on record saying that that's what they were searching for and they felt like part of something and even when we watched that documentary the um on the buddha field holy hell like a lot of those people were saying how you know even though they despised that like central person like reishi i think he goes by now um that that name but even though they despise him like the group itself like they still have love for each other and you know they're they're thankful for that experience to spend that much time together so like yeah, and you hear that with nixium as well um just with the group <laughs> itself like there were very happy times within it and as we saw in the other documentary as well um And I think Sarah Edmondson also goes into that and how like Vanguard week, which was Keith Raniere's birthday week, was the happiest time of the year. Yeah. Yeah, I I think in terms of just general self-help, I think there's like with anything, literally anything, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And if there's when there's people who are trying to sell you like there's only one way to get better and it's by buying this eight week program or, you know. That's not necessarily like that's trying to use self-help, I think, in a way to just boost your own profit. But if you're trying to like, you know, capitalist. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to like help people broadly, just be like, you know, what helps is X for me. And if it maybe, you know, just like suggestions and stuff. I mean, that's considered self-help. 
um, as well. Yeah, or there's a lot mean... of insight that you yeah. can get from other people, which is why people go to therapy and that's self help, mm-hmm. that's self care. I'm a believer in therapy. Yeah. Are you specifically as talking about who's gone to therapy? Yeah, are you specifically talking about books or groups like Nixium that are considered self help groups? I would I would caution anyone um, who seeks self help um, through anything that that has a profit margin attached. Okay, to so it. you mean the self help industry? And, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, therapy does fall in that. I mean, that does come with yeah. a price tag. But uh, any sort of product that that promotes itself, if there's a promotional aspect to it. Mm-hmm. Then I immediately have a have a inherent distrust of it. I think I would. I you know, would agree. You don't see therap- You don't see therapists going around, you know, promoting themselves on fucking, you know, the Warner Brother mm-hmm. Network, the CW, yeah, Hallmark Channel. At yeah. The, yeah, at the bottom of the screen, you don't see two therapists, you know, hugging and giving <laughs> an ad. But it's no, true. they do that with drugs instead. Yeah, they do. Mm. They definitely do. I mean, I see what you're saying. I think the 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 common the what i think the the crux of what you're trying to get at is more like people just should be not like not as quick to just buy into something because because yeah. you know skepticism i think is far more healthy than and i think like with anything like how i talk about i talk about this concept or not even it's not even a concept it's just like this this idea um of balance i talk about a lot on the the closing out the week because a lot of the stories that i cover um, you know, at the end of every week, always like comes back to just the balance, how there is not balance in terms of like, you know, when talking about a story of an innocent black person getting shot by the police, like you can connect that back to balance because there's not a balance between, you know, power within our society or, you know, representation within our society. And I think that you can connect that idea of balance in terms of self-help too. To not buy into something so fast, you know, you have to have you have you have to buy into a degree, uh, but you have to also keep yourself removed enough or detached, like Quinn and I have talked yeah. about before, detachment to, to self, be able to see. Self help is also yeah. it's also self fulfilling, right? And there's yeah, and there's in terms of I mean, there's a reason why I hang on to my fortune cookie fortunes, uh-huh. you know. I mean, yeah, so, I I see what you're saying. I think it's too like self part of self help comes uh or a part of self-help is self-reflection and if you're not reflecting on what is helping you to see if any of those things that are helping you could like potential could potentially turn malicious then yeah i mean it can fall back on you if you're not reflecting so i think that's that's the key is like you have to always reflect on your experience even when you're having a good time in a, in a self-help group if you ever are participating in that or even in therapy I mean, I go to therapy and like I reflect on my experience afterward to see like, okay, did my therapist really like connect with what I was saying or could I have explained things a different way? I think it just comes back to reflection and and self-analyzation as well. You know, how do you uh, what is your preferred method of self-reflection? How do you how do you how do you uh, dive into Gabby? Would you like to answer that first? I feel oh. like I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> <laughs> I've also done a lot of talking. Um, yeah, yeah. For reflection, I definitely I write a lot, and I think being able to just put your words onto a piece of paper and almost like a conversation with mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I started. Um, I have this like joke. I've started. I started journaling, um, and when you open the journal, the very first day mm-hmm. is. December 30th, 2019. Oh man. And I've kept it up all through 2020. Well, so, that's yeah. Yeah, it's been really interesting to see that um go through cuz it's like, oh, I'm so excited for the new year. I yeah. like I'm in a new city. I'm so stoked and then it's like March. <laughs> oh, I lost my job. Oh, <laughs> I lost my second job. It's just- Oh, it, things are getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this like downward slope of the entire year. That journal is going to be worth something someday. I tell okay, you so what. that's the joke. That's the joke is that one day when we're all dead, 
I hope somebody will have this journal and it'll just go into like a COVID memorial museum. <laughs> time capsule. You time, time capsule. capsule. It. Yeah. Just bury it once you fill every yeah. page. That that is true. And then as civilization civilization crumbles, you know, <laughs> at some point or another, someone will come across it. They'll be like, "Oh my god, <laughs> what happened here?" <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's how I do a lot of my reflection is through writing. I just stand in front of a mirror and berate myself. <laughs> just picturing that these uh, these like illustrations that you're crafting within my mind with all of these stories, Quinn, or not even stories, but just like people hanging from hooks from rafters, you standing in front of a mirror berating yourself, mirror. like where yeah, I like to put on I like to put on lipstick <laughs> and just completely berate myself. <laughs> well, connecting that back to um Nixium specifically um, <laughs> is was there any sort of uh like how Quinn talked about in Waco last week or two weeks ago where uh, I forgot David Koresh had to compete with another person to to assert power within that little sect of the Branch Davidians we're trying to reanimate a corpse trying to bring it back to life or like with uh you know Jim Jones and Jonestown where they had a, a pet like chimpanzee or was there anything like pretty peculiar interesting about nixium when you were like doing your study on it that you could share peculiar yeah. or interesting i think vanguard week is pretty interesting do you know uh, anything more about it like what they would specifically do they chance what made it so fun? yeah they just go and party that's it i'm pretty How sure boring. That's boring. <laughs> that sounds awesome a week-long burning man i know is that just is that basically it they just throw a gigantic fest for him yeah pretty much Pretty much. Um, Was, did they have like a giant like like you know how in Macy's Day Parade they have like a giant like blimp looking <laughs> fucking thing of Charlie Brown? Did they do that for David Koresh too? Did, did they do anything like like did they have like a mile long birthday cake or something ridiculous? I don't know about David Koresh, but or not uh, David Koresh. Keith, I'm sorry, Keith Raniere. All these people's names. All these names. We got to get them straight. You know, I um, did not look too much into Vanguard Week, um, mm. but that is pretty odd. Yeah. So that is. I, I think it sounds pretty lit. Lit. <laughs> that is pretty lit. Litty. They should. Would they keep Vanguard Week, but just rebrand it to something else to not reference Keith Raniere? Like you today. Know. Yeah, like like should they keep up the tradition but just take a strip away everything having to do with Nixium and allow other people to come in? I'm assuming no. it would be held in Albany, right? Albany. They just kind of make it into a Hanukkah kind of situation. Yeah, Hanukkah. <laughs> no, because I think that's where we're talking about self-reflection and just being able to accept these moments yeah. and accept they're not what they are mm -hmm. anymore and just moving past that and letting go. So today, does Nixium is still does is Nixium still an MLM or has it rebranded itself into a, another type of group or I mean everyone's on trial so I th okay. think they all it just kind of has it just crumbled. fell apart That's yeah interesting. but DOS was still because when Nixium fell mm -hmm. DOS was still in operations but I that's all it's all crumbled wow. I wonder if there's like a vacuum in those people's lives who are not on trial, who are more like more so the victims of mm -hmm. this cult. And because like in the in the case of the Branch Davidians, like they are still a group to this day. Of course, they don't, you know, there's I don't believe there is like a central like leader of them, like how David Koresh was, uh, you know, the leader of this gr of the group that was, you know, taken down at Waco. But um, I'm just curious if there's going to be another like group that is formed from those victims or if they, because of this federal investigation, they've kind of seen the light, so to speak. And they're just like, okay, this is a very unhealthy, very toxic situation I'm in. You know, I just, yeah, wonder. I hope so. I hope that watching these people that they worshiped on trial shows that they're people that shouldn't be worshiped. Yeah. And also with all the information now out there about Nixium that they don't still follow it. Mm -hmm. But it's also really hard to let go. It's really hard to accept 
that this person or people that you fawned over are now are not good people yeah you know I think we like we probably do it in our daily lives as well and a lot of victims do that even um like rape victims Mm -hmm. they do that as well yeah so Mm. I hope not but there might be um there's actually this resource um the cult education institute and yeah so they do um they have been doing a lot of research in cults and specifically rich alan ross Mm -hmm. he's a big researcher there and it there's studies that show that it takes about three days to actually deprogram somebody from being brain from this brainwashing well three days yeah but you have to work with them for those three days it's not like you pull them out and yeah. then for three days, it's like, okay, you're better now. Yeah, exactly. You have to like make sense work with them. That's yeah. crazy, though. I would have three, I would think took three days for Jesus to come back to life. So they say he might have been alive the entire time. Um, but that's interesting. I would think it'd be more time. Like after years of brainwashing and trying to get put you into the state for three days of intensive like care. Yeah, it just can be undone. I yes and no because well, I'm entirely. sure there's a ton of just leftover guilt and feelings that, of course, you'll still have to work on oh, with probably with a therapist. <laughs> true, true. Mm, it's an industry. <laughs> we got to We got to get. Um, you got to get better help to sponsor this podcast. I hear better I hear help. There, yeah, they're like a therapist podcast or yeah. uh, sponsor or something app, and I hear them on podcasts all the time. So really? reach Still out to, to this them. day. To this day, you hear that? Yeah, that's it's just like a- I'd much rather have them as a sponsor than me undies. Really, <laughs> I would like me undies. I wouldn't mind it. I mean, I'm, it's not my first pick, but I mean, I'd take it. Still working on that PBR sponsorship, man. Still working on that. That's like my dream. What the fuck is PBR? PBR? What do you mean, P- the beer? they sponsor a lot of stuff but um that's interesting i just i'm quite i was questioning better help because they were in like the news a couple years ago for being like a scam or something but because that, that's why i was like are they still sponsoring stuff like i haven't oh heard anything but maybe maybe they've restructured or like i don't know i haven't heard anything since that point so it could very well be a thing where like they just you know change their ways since that time definitely not going to get a sponsorship from yeah yeah it's over now but oh well whatever it's fine fine. yeah but i mean i will say that if anybody is struggling with uh things during this pretty crazy time in our country or really just the world with covid and with uh you know the, the the election coming up but there's a lot of stress a lot of anxiety a lot of angst in the air and i think you know seeking help um isn't necessarily isn't a bad thing at all especially now i encourage you to to do that and i think it's interesting because like there is an alternate reality where in which these three cults could have turned out to be like positive things for these people where if if jim jones just wouldn't have been a self-centered asshole with a pet chimpanzee and a big blockhead and and david koresh wouldn't have sold illegal guns and if um, I forgot the Nixium guy, Keith Raniere, Keith Raniere, Keith Raniere just uh, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have caught, ha- like enslaved or helped slay enslave like women and branded them and like wouldn't have started this cult of personality for himself. Like that old chestnut, <laughs> like the, the, the end goal for these groups, if they would have stayed true to that instead of becoming all about one person, you know, would have helped people. And um so I think that's the moral of at least that's what I'm taking away from this series of on cults that we've done for the past. I think it's been six weeks at this point because we've done mm-hmm. we put one out every two weeks. Yeah, what is that's the moral moral you take away. From that's that? what I would at, after hearing Nixium. What would you take away from it, Quinn? Um, don't trust bitches named Nancy. <laughs> I've never trust a woman named Nancy in my life. I've never known a woman named Nancy to be a truthful, honest, and outstanding. 
Are you kidding me? What my a really, really, really close family friend is named Nancy, and I look up to her. <laughs> so <laughs> Well, you're you're fortunate to have met a Nancy that that Buck's tradition. I know an amazing myself, Nancy. Wow. Myself, I've known nothing but deplorable Nancy's. Except for Nancy Drew. <laughs> Nancy <laughs> Drew is the homie. I love Nancy Drew. Those books, man. Great. What um so like Nancy was somebody who was involved in Nixium, I I believe, right? Yeah, Nancy Salzman. Nancy Salzman. Okay. All right. Yeah. She was the purveyor of Yeah, them. she was. Yeah, fuck yeah. that Nancy. Oh, also, um, Keith Ranieri like had sex with her and also her daughter. So Oh, naturally. Yeah, I mean, I I would have guessed. <laughs> kind of put the two in. Are you really a cult are you really a cult leader if you're not having sex? With everyone. <laughs> with everyone. Right. Yeah. I don't think you could call yourself the leader of a cult if you're not just running. It's true. Everybody. I I say I was arguing with within myself during the Waco podcast, if you don't remember, to see like because I was like, I don't know if you could really call David Koresh a cult leader. And then at the very end, you were like, yeah, I know he like did all this stuff pertaining to sex and like kept people from like he like abstain. He (laughs) like what was it? He is the one who like had sex for everybody because it was like a burden. He he, he took. (laughs) Yeah, he took uh, on the burden of sex, so, of sexual yeah. temptation. And at that point, I was like, "Yeah, no, he is a cult leader for sure, hundred percent." Yeah, it's like a pre, it's like a prerequisite. Having sex with everyone is the GE to becoming a cult leader. It's true. It's true. Actually, um, speaking of GEs of cults, uh, Rick Allen Ross, who the researcher of the um, Cult Educational Influence Era Institute, mm. he broke it down into a couple of different pillars of what makes a cult a cult. Yeah. And I'll read them off to you. So it's personality driven. So an authoritative leader and becomes an object of worship. Um, the process of indoctrination, mm. take, taking the influence, so exploiting personal beliefs. Yeah. No legitimate reason to leave. This is, of course, in their mind. Mm -hmm. And then the leader never takes responsibility. Oh, yeah. That's a huge one. That is gigantic. Dang, Rick Ross coming through with the definitions. I love it. Mm -hmm. My man, Rick Ross. If only this was the Rick Ross from from Dade County. (laughs) I know. Could you imagine on the side of being... Like a music artist, Rick Ross is also a researcher of cults and cult activity. Rich Ross. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh. That was my fault. That no, was my fault. Oh. Dang. So close. I was fairly optimistic Man. that the Rick Ross who dropped Mafia Music 1 and 2 <laughs> is a multiple franchise owner of Wingstop was also the, the, the foremost expert in cult. Yeah. Man. Worship. Maybe. That's a job if title. Only. It's a job of being a cult expert. You can really be labeled as a cult expert. Huh. It's pretty cool. I bet that looks good on a resume. Does, yeah, I think I think that would. The man, you probably would I be able to work if, with the FBI. If they all I feel get like we together, got three cult experts right here. <laughs> I wonder if they all get together and they've created their own cult, like a cult convention. A cult convention. Yes, oh, that's a great idea. Great Flat business, Earth convention. Where, where do you think they meet every year? <laughs> Fucking Albany. Probably, Probably Cosmo, Albany. Right? <laughs> Albany, New York, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Albany, New York, yeah. They probably have a bunch of jokes of, you know, serving fruit punch and stuff. Yeah. Or flavor aid, actually. Yeah. Those They're like, ha ha ha, these suckers. <laughs> I think this has been a very successful three episodes of Cult Talk. And the Colt series, our first ever series we've done on the Closers podcast. Woo-hoo. Thank you, Gabby, for coming on and being a great guest and host. So no, thank, thank you, very, you. Thank you very much. Yeah, very impressed. And uh, we hope that you come back on um, at some point to maybe talk more about Colts or another series. Hopefully. At some point. Yeah, if we Theme get more information Colts. about um, the trials, love to do a follow up. That'd be really fun. Definitely, definitely. Right. I guess I would say I second everything Marco just said. He's pretty much said it all. <laughs> I do that. I tend to do that. I tend to just say too much and say everything. Oh. Because, like, yeah, that happens pretty often on the show. We're like, I'm like, Quinn, do you have anything to say? Um, 
you said everything I wanted to say, Marco. So, I mean, not really. I'm like, oh, shit. All right. I should just shut up. But, Gabby, is there anything you want to say to the, the glorious, fabulous people out there before we depart from this segment? No, besides thank you. And I'm stoked for when this comes out and I can send it off to all my friends. I know I have a lot of people asking me about it and they're they're pretty stoked of um when to when to expect this and um my brother honestly is gonna be so hyped for the whole gabby the goose intro oh, um man. i'm stoked for him to reach out to me and be like ha 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 this was hilarious maybe we could get a sponsor from the affleck duck <laughs> yo that is that's the one i would be glad to to switch from AAA to affleck specifically for this podcast. Yeah, I mean, if, for this podcast. if it meant that I, we can we can be introduced every episode by the Aflac duck that'd be sick either I that or the, or the gecko also starts with a g that just means i have to be on here more yeah <laughs> next time not a bad next idea time, the gecko but Thank you again, Gabby. This has been really fun. I appreciate you a lot. And oh, oh, we talked oh. about Seattle slang, and we never followed up on it. Oh, yeah, that's right. We are okay. Seattle yes. slang. Yes. What is it? What is there anything pertaining to Seattle slang that okay. you know? So I talked to one out of two or three friends that I know that are actually from the area. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And they said that there is no Seattle. Are they called satellites? Satellites. <laughs> Come on. They sit on top of the. They circle around the space needle. I I wouldn't. Oh, I wouldn't man, this, is, this pun is just getting better. And better. <laughs> anyway, so Seattle slang is yeah. not really a thing, and I, I figured <laughs> it's all a personality and a vibe. Hmm. Okay. So, what is that personality and vibe? Quinn is already so doubtful. Jesus <laughs> Christ! You can't even contain it for a second. Oh it's because of the Seahawks. Yeah, it's just the Seahawks. Thing. No, I thought I had a clear definition of what slang was, but well, she said there's no slang. It's just it, like the differentiation of people in Seattle is more based on the character, I think, and like yeah. vibe, right? So, what is that vibe? It's they hate Californians. Oh. <laughs> We hate it too. <laughs> so I guess feelings see, see mutual. It's a mutual feelings feeling. mutual. <laughs> um, and they're just sta- like standoffish and clicky. That's- oh, so like Southern Californians. Okay, cool, perfect. Yeah, but more grunge. Oh, they, they wear flannels. Okay, a lot cool. more flannels. Nice. A lot more. Just means they bathe less. And they bathe less. Yeah. Probably. Yep. Makes sense. I. If you can walk into a restaurant and you're not sure if somebody is um just got back from a camping trip Mm. or they're from here you know you're in the right spot you know you're in seattle wow that's very interesting nope that was a bad joke no no no. you got to cut that out i i butchered (laughs) i butchered i butchered the joke the joke was (laughs) i'm not cutting it out now because that 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 just made it super funny (laughs) seattle deserves bad jokes (laughs) (laughs) no it was if you if you can't tell your waiter apart from your from the homeless person or something, oh, like oh, cut it out! You can't. There's I no can't way I'm cutting it out now. That's hilarious. As imperfect. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, honey. That's already too late. That okay? So so just these people are just very uh, okay. They're just to themselves. Yeah, to themselves, yeah. and they hate Californians. Yeah, that seems like Swedish people, but just you know, not as good hygiene. Why do they hate us? Yeah, because that's a good question. They think I don't want to say they. That's so overgeneralized. From but from what you gather. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> there's just this idea that um, Californians hate California so much because of for governmental reasons. Mm. They move elsewhere and then try to change it to be more like California. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. That's what's happening yeah. in Tennessee right now. There's a fair fair amount of i guess gentrifiers you could say mm. in our home state yeah. mm-hmm. fair amount of gentrifiers i would agree with that that is a very yeah. uh correct observation i'd say they come from certain portions i'm not sure if they come from san joaquin valley or the sacramento valley, yeah but. i'd say that's a very yeah bay and socal thing no i'd say there's some people from sacramento that I definitely would cl- I'd be classified in that but i don't think it's a majority that <laughs> 
Yeah. Definitely. But that's very interesting, Gabby. Thank well, you for see the private investigator. <laughs> the private very investigator. Very, very impressive. Didn't get that joke. <laughs> you didn't get the joke because like Gabby the Gator from last episode. Investigator. Oh, Jesus okay. Christ. See, and I'm not gonna cut that. I thought we I thought we had moved on. I thought we moved on from the goose to the goose. She she has multiple nicknames now, apparently. Jealous. <laughs> you do too. <laughs> You have so many that you gave yourself. No, that's that not is, true. Okay, well, maybe you didn't give yourself, but like when we first met, the, you introduced yourself. Or no, you didn't introduce yourself, but you told me that you were like the pistol whipper, <laughs> <laughs> the young pistol whipper. Um, you had a rap name that I don't know if you want to share with people. Uh, no, that's inappropriate. Yeah, but there's a rap name. There's the moon dog. There's Quinnithin Kalani. That's just like a little. I didn't give you myself did, that. That's a you terrible didn't. Name. But but I'm just saying you have multiple too. So I don't think most of them I actually got from Double A. It's true. What's your favorite from Double A? Double A is our ex manager at the store we used to work at. By the way, Gabby. <laughs> Every time I get a message from Double A, it's Sam, Sam Quinn. Sam Quinn. That's a great one. Sam Quentin, what's up? <laughs> Lock him down. That is, a great one. that is a great one. Get pretty terrible puns. Yeah, there. that is a pretty bad one. Bad in a good Makes in a bad smile. way. But anyways, uh, next we're going to do Weekly Rex and then we'll get out of your hair. Thank you for tuning in to this uh, talk on Nixium and be sure to watch the documentary series on HBO. It is fantastic. That's who we should be, we should be sponsored by is HBO. Yes. Kept oh. talking about them the whole time. <laughs> if only. That'd be fun. I would love that. <laughs> Have, we plug HBO a lot. We do plug we? HBO a lot. Have Great Larry resource. David on the podcast would be a dream. Oh my goodness. But <laughs> maybe one day. We'll see. But without further ado, here is Weekly Rex. All right, so that was our conversation on Nixium with Gabby Elwell. Um, it was a great series. I don't know how you felt about doing a series, Quinn, but I really enjoyed doing those three episodes with I, you guys. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Gabby brought a class and a, a sophistication that was uh, missing amongst us, this duo of degenerates. Yeah, it's yeah. I don't think people look at us and think, "Oh, classy and sophisticated." I right. don't think those are the adjectives that come to mind when they when people see us. But they probably think we're from Seattle, but <laughs> definitely not. Speaking of Seattle, we have some Seattle themed recommendations that were given to us by Gabriella. Uh, she didn't want to say them herself just because she was busy, but we we're going to plug some Seattle places for her. Quinn, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, I guess the first place in Seattle I'd uh, I'd recommend is the Recoup Spa. Or maybe you just need to relax and you need a good Swedish deep tissue massage. I don't know if they offer those, but I assume they do. Go to the Recoup Spa in Seattle. Particularly if you're from Seattle, I imagine you're a filthy degenerate. <laughs> you could probably use about two hours of a nice solid relaxation time. You time. That's what you need, Seattle. You need more you time. Because nothing is about you. <laughs> Damn, so. Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Quinn. I appreciate. It. <laughs> Fuck. I appreciate your uh, your description of uh, my candor. <laughs> yeah, your candor on Seattle. We know that deep down there is a smidge of love you have for that city. And uh, I was tasked in recommending the Mount Rainier Trail in Washington. I don't know how far it is from Seattle. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's not very far. Um, but uh, if you're in the area, you know, you can go on that trail and get a pretty cool view of Mount Rainier. Mm. Um, and uh, I imagine uh, yeah, what else might you see on this trail, Marco? Tears, maybe trees. Trees, probably tears from the um, sky. For sure. It's probably raining, yeah. right? Yeah, it's probably raining. But, you know, there's some clear days in, in Washington. It's not all just bleak, you know, um, weather. But, I mean, I, I can imagine that Mount Rainier Trail is a very beautiful trail that right. a lot of people have had many great experiences and uh, great memories walking down and, you know, perusing. So, I mean, I 
I'm not going to knock the, the the fine people of Seattle because I have nothing against Seattle. I know Quinn; it's a very sports driven uh, disdain he has. But I imagine but, that uh, Mount Rainier, which is outside Seattle, is a beautiful, majestic place, and the people mm-hmm. encompassing the area are probably some of the finest people this country has to offer. Hmm. Wow, that very nice of you to say. Oh well, of course I'm a big big naturalist. <laughs> Well, okay. Well, I, I'm done with my recommendation that was recommended by Gabby for us to, to plug. Um, so, Quinn, what is your recommendation for the week, your personal recommendation? Uh, my personal recommendation, I've been watching a new show on Netflix called Lucifer. And when I mm. first thought this show, when I first got into this show, I was like, wow, this is real hokey. And then I realized <laughs> that it it does that on purpose. Uh, and it, it buys into it. It doesn't take itself too seriously. Uh-huh. The, uh, the main star, uh, Tom Ellis, as the aforementioned, uh, Lucifer is absolutely magnetic and brilliant in his portrayal as Satan, adds a real sympathy and humanity to him. And, uh, if you get beyond the, uh, the eighties sort of, uh, the 80s sort of uh, cult classicness of it. Uh, uh-huh. It does ask some pretty profound questions involving religion, free will, the free will paradox, for example. You know, is Satan uh, really the purveyor of evil deeds or is he simply uh, enacting God's will? Hmm. You know, that's interesting. an interesting question. For me, as someone who grew up in Catholic school, I personally always found Satan to be the most sympathetic figure in the Bible. And uh, I think the show really sort of emphasizes that and adds layers to uh, to uh, theology, to the Judeo-Christian theology. I grew up Catholic. Uh, I'm a, I guess currently you could say I'm a non-practicing Catholic. Uh, mm. but I become a pretty practicing Catholic whenever I'm scared shitless. <laughs> so... <laughs> So oh, I cool. yeah I would recommend Lucifer. It's a fun show. It's a really fun yeah. show. I'll definitely check it out. It's on Netflix, you said, right? Yep, it's on Netflix. I believe five seasons right now. I think there's a sixth season coming out uh, towards the end of this year or uh, beginning of next year, probably around February. Nice, cool. Well, I'll definitely be sure to check that out. Uh, my recommendation, my personal recommendation for this episode is three songs from one of my favorite bands from the Bay Area, Elder Brother. Uh, Their three songs off their forthcoming album, I Won't Fade On You, is the the forthcoming album. And I Get So Tired of You, The Champion of the East Bay, and If You Love Me Like You Say, are the three singles that are from that forthcoming album that that the band has released um, in the past week. And the album... Uh, comes out on August 25th. The band Elder Brother is comprised of uh, the guitarist and vocalist, one of the vocalists from the band The Story So Far, also a Bay Area uh, band, uh, Kevin Geyer, and uh, the vocalist and guitarist Dan Rose. Um, That duo has comprised Elder Brother ever since 2014, and they quickly rose in my, uh, you know, my top, 30 bands that I love. They've quickly rose to the very top of that list. You have 30 bands you love? Well, I'm just saying, like, if there's, you know, if we have a top 30 list, like, I don't know, to kind of make it a sports reference. But um, with their albums Heavy Head in 2014 and Stay Inside in 2018, uh, I've been looking forward to their third album uh, ever since uh, Stay Inside from 2018 was put out. These three tracks are very interesting. They go into a different direction, slightly, uh, pertaining to Elder Brothers' sound. They're a little more groovy, in my opinion. Um, The other two were very more indie rock focused. I feel like this is very... um, It's still indie, but it has some really, like, infectious bass lines that kind of drive these songs. So, Mm -hmm. if you're interested in that type of music, something you can maybe dance a little bit to, Nothing too crazy, but, you know, just you can move to it. These three songs from Elder Brother are definitely um, 
things that I recommend you to listen to if you like that type of music. For sure. And be sure to listen to their album that comes out on the 25th of August. It is called I Won't Fade on You by Elder Brother. And that's my recommendation. And then if I could ask you one last question, uh-huh. just because it just popped up into my mind. Well, this will be coming out on Wednesday, but yeah. in about an hour and a half is our fantasy football draft. Is there any uh, any feelings, any intense feelings you got going into it? Any anticipatory no. feelings? I'm cool as a cucumber, man. Got it all I'm, laid I'm, out? I'm, I'm cool and... Look, the people that that reach in drafts and the people that kind of um, the people that 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 go into it with a hardcore plan are the ones that fail in the draft. You mm. got to be like Bruce Lee once said. You got to be like water. It fits into the teacup. Like it is the teacup. Exactly. I get what you're saying. Let me ask and you once this. You get, once you get into the draft, you got to become the draft. And whatever the draft gives you, you got to just take it. Let me you ask you this. Take it. McCaffrey. Does he go in the first two picks? Neither of us have the first two picks. Does McCaffrey go in the first two picks? Yes. Oof. Yes, he does. He's he's going one. I know I'm pretty sure he's going number one. Well. It's gonna be it's gonna be McCaffrey, Saquon, and at that point, I have the third pick and I get my pick of the litter. It's gonna be interesting. I think you're gonna be really interested in my pick. I feel like the first two picks are the the two picks that you really have some leverage in terms of like not just taking what falls to you, but you can really go in a lot of different directions, especially in our league, which is PPR. Right. So with the PPR draft, you have a lot more flexibility, a lot more possibilities to draft guys that can impact your team at different levels in different ways. Mm. Whereas in standard, um, the challenge is that you don't have those every, you know, every time someone catches a pass, uh, you don't get a point. Right. Which some people argue is, is you know, how it should be. Other people would say it's a game. The whole point of a game is to get points, so why not maximize points? That's There's the arguments game. to be had. There's arguments to be had, but at the end of the day, we play PPR, and uh, I think you'll be very interested to see where I go with my That's the pick. game. And Who uh, are you targeting in, at your pick? Because you have, what, pick six? I got I got pick six, and I kind of feel, you know, like you were saying earlier, when you're in the middle of the road, you know, you have your best available, you have guys that you earmark, but, you know, knowing at pick six, some some crazy things could happen in those first five. So uh, if, if McCaffrey falls all the way down to six, I'll pass. I'll six? pass. I'm not a, we, as we talked about last week. Yeah, yeah, I am not a believer in the Panthers this year, nor am I a believer in McCaffrey this year. So uh, which so, pains me okay. to say, but if Dalvin Cook falls to you at six, do you take Dalvin Cook? I don't know. See, that's that's a tricky question. Dalvin Cook is a great stud running back. Dalvin Cook also gets injured quite often. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's that's an interesting proposition. Depending on where Dalvin Cook goes, if he falls to me, then it means probably Michael Thomas was picked. If Dalvin Cook was picked, it means Michael Thomas may fall to me. So it just kind of depends. Would you take Michael Thomas one? In the first round? Yeah. I like think he, your first pick. I think he, he falls. I, yeah, I think he warrants uh, some strong consideration based on I think, based I on think it's a no-brainer years. to take him if he falls yeah. for you. I think yeah. you have to snag him. If he doesn't, and you don't want to go running back, which I would totally understand, honestly, dude, Devontae Adams, I would not be mad at you taking him at six. But at that point, it's uh, I know you have some susness surrounding the, the, the Packers. So I don't know if you would necessarily be comfortable with it, but... Right, I think Devontae Adams is a is a strong contender at that spot as well. It's possible, man. Who knows? And then, um, I guess lastly, I like to give a birthday shout out to an alumni of uh, the Closers Podcast, Fantasy League, and La Liga Alvarado and Store Ten Forty. A birthday shout out to the Galt Legend himself, Spencer Cyphers, who celebrated his birthday this past week. Happy birthday, Spencer! We love you. Hope everything's going well, brother. God bless. Yeah, happy birthday, man. I think it was also his uh, daughter's birthday, too, Brindley. So, happy Prime. birthday. Double happy birthday to Happy birthday to Spencer's daughter as well. To really the, cool. the whole Cypher family. <laughs> yeah, this, the clan. The clan of the Cypher. So, 
that's been our episode uh, on Nixium. Hope you enjoyed it. Please follow us on Instagram at The Closers Podcast, on Facebook at Closers Podcast, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are The Closers Podcast. Uh, not sure what we're going to be doing for next week quite yet, but I will let you know as soon as details are made available. So please follow us on those social media so you can keep up to date with what the next episode is going to be. So without any further ado, for Quinn Kalani, for Gabriella Elwell, and for The Closers Podcast, I will bid you an adieu. Take care. <laughs>